everyone, welcome to today's textile talk. I'm Lucy Shaken. I'm SACWA's communications coordinator and your textile talks organizer. Textile talks are presented by the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates or SACWA, and Surface Design Association. We love bringing you these free programs every week thanks to the support of our sponsors and contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. If you enjoy textile talks, please consider supporting us at sakwa.com slash TT support. And if you want to be on textile talks, this is the last day to submit to Sakwa's open call for proposals for the 2023 calendar. If you're a fiber artist with a story to tell, we really want to hear from you. And all of that info is at sakwa.com slash calls. And I'm going to put both those links in the chat in just a minute. A few Zoom notes before we begin. This is a webinar. We cannot see or hear you, but we can read your comments in the chat. If you have any questions during today's program, please type them into the Q&A function. And if you have suggestions for ways we can improve or for topics that you'd like to see in future textile talks, please let us know in the post-event survey. Today's program is Contemporary Curves by Audrey Essery, presented by our guests, the National Quilt Museum. So please welcome artist Audrey Essery and Becky Glasby, the Director of Education at the National Quilt Museum. Take it away. Thanks, Lucy, and thanks for having us here on Textile Talks today. Hey, everybody, I'm Becky with the National Quilt Museum. We are in Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, many of you may know we were founded in 1991, so we've been here for over 30 years. Now is celebrating all things quilting and quilters and fiber arts to come through. Um, our big goal, our mission is honoring the work of today's quilters. And we do that through our collections and presenting the works of today's quilters, both near and far, um, to a lot of diverse audiences, uh, through our exhibitions, through our educational programs, uh, support of artists, and here locally um, and regionally in Paducah and the Western Kentucky area, also through tourism development um, and being a part of our local community. So it's just great to be here today. Uh, we are a contemporary museum, which means our collection specifically focuses on quilts made from 1980 up through present day, which means that we get to work with a lot of living artists and current artists, which is really exciting for all of us to be able to share those stories and share all these different styles and techniques and um, abilities and methods of quilt making. And we're just thrilled to be able to have Audrey here with us today, but also to be showcasing her exhibition currently here at the National Quilt Museum, um, Contemporary Curves, which is here through October 18th. So there's plenty of time to come visit, come see it um, after you're inspired today by hearing Audrey talk about her work and her progress. This exhibition deals with circular shapes, a lot of Audrey's complex curved seams, dynamic high contrast colors, and dense quilting. So welcome, Audrey. Thank you so much. Well, let me go ahead and share my screen because we have a lot to talk about today. Absolutely. Just one second. Is 
it's doubly exciting for us here at the museum since Audrey is a Kentucky artist, Kentucky quilter, um, just a little bit eastward of us out in Louisville area. So that's always a thrill to showcase some of our local uh, in-state artists to go through. Um, and before we get into all of the exhibitions specific, if you want to start us out, Audrey, with telling us a little bit about how you came to quilting or how you got involved in quilting as a whole. Sure. Well, I started quilting in 2005. I got an invitation from my now mother-in-law, Nancy, and she's watching right now. Hello. And um, I don't think that she knew at that time that I was uh, ever had a background in sewing. I was doing a lot of scrapbooking actually at the time, um, but she had signed her two daughters up for a quilt class and she invited me to come along. And I think I surprised her by saying yes. Um, and this was the class of that quilt. Uh, my very first quilt was the Hunter Star pattern by Jan Krenz. And it is an intermediate pattern <laughs> and I knew nothing about quilting. And so a very generous and patient teacher at a local quilt shop uh, was uh, taught me all about uh, quilting with a quarter inch seam and showed me how to safely use a rotary cutter and help me pick uh, and understand the fabrics that I should be using for quilting. Um, and so I started quilting in 2005 and I just never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for us. <laughs> yeah. What, what drew you to keep quilting after this first class, after this intermediate learning, huge learning curve, I'm sure. What, what kind of made you fall in love with it? Um, well, I had done a lot of art as a kid growing up, but I was not a very talented drawer or painter. Um, I loved photography in high school. I did a lot of that. But when I found quilting, I feel like it helped me find my kind of a niche um, as a medium um, because you can have a lot of precision um, in the techniques that you know, you work kind of one step at a time with the precision. And so all the way from making a template to cutting, to sewing, to then quilting the fabric, you're kind of always keeping your eye on that precision. And there's a lot of customization. So I could take a pattern from a designer like Jan Krenz and feel like I, by selecting a palette of fabrics, I felt like I could make it my own in a way. Um, so I think that the precision and having that strength geometrically, and then also then um, being able to kind of put my own colors in the design was something that really made me feel at home and quilting. I love that. I think a lot of us, I know I do a lot of times that same feeling of choosing your colors and whatever the pattern states, you can decide to tweak it or turn the block a different way and like you say put that own stamp on it um, mm -hmm. which is just so much fun in, in every aspect of quilt making to go through wonderful so I know in the exhibit we have one of your pieces offset and I believe this was the first in your radial series which I know is probably a little before I started kind of seeing you online and kind of seeing some of your work in details and so what kind of prompted that what's become this series, this radial series that you've been working on and showcasing in your work? Um, yeah, so when I started making this quilt, I did not have the idea to work in a series at all. So when I made the quilt, it was at a time in the summer of 2018, where I was trying to kind of find my voice a little bit in quilting. I had learned that QuiltCon, the annual um, quilt show put on by the Modern Quilt Guild, was going to be located in Nashville, which was just three hours south of me. And I thought, well, if I'm going to the show, maybe I should attend, or if I, you know, the show's so close, maybe I should go. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to attend, maybe I should try to enter a quilt. Um, not realizing that it is a highly competitive show. <laughs> and so I was just kind of working in a silo in my basement, making things since 2005. And uh, finally, I was ready to kind of step out of my comfort zone and try 
my own pattern or try, you know, try to make my own design. So these four quilts were the four quilts that I made in hopes of getting into um, that modern quilt guild quilt con event. And uh, two of them were juried in and two were not. So the two on the bottom were accepted into the show. And so I had buttons made of both of these quilts and I was like trying to very awkwardly socialize with people I'd never met before by passing out these buttons. And people started asking me about Offset, the quilt on the bottom right, how I made that quilt um, and, you know, just had a lot of interest in that specific quilt. And it was made for a two color challenge uh, that was featured at the show that year, which is why I chose black and white as the two colors. Um, and so that quilt was selected to travel with the best of quilt con that year, which kind of just helped uh, get more eyeballs on on that quilt. And I enjoyed so much talking with people at the show about the quilt um, and thinking about uh, working uh, on that quilt that I, when I came home, I thought, well, maybe I should make more quilts that look like that because people sure seem to really like that one. And so that got my mind thinking a little bit more about how I could uh, work with that idea of concentric circles and uh, radiating wedges. It's fascinating to see all four of these pieces together and to see how, you know, what you were making or, you know, those different pieces, like you said, that got in. Um, and I know I'd asked about offset, but I'm also looking at a slice of lime and just seeing how that has, you know, all those different shapes and details. Are those curved seams in the background there? Are they all pretty angular in that slice of lime quilt? Yeah, they're all in set seams. So mm -hmm. I have not done any extensive applique. I would not consider myself a talented hand sewer at all. <laughs> um, and so I, this was pretty improvisationally pieced. I gave myself some guidelines with a pencil, but I just kind of cut into the fabric with a rotary cutter. <laughs> and um, I made some mistakes along the way uh, and, you know, was able to kind of recover and fix some things. But um, no, all of those seams are just totally, totally set in to the design. And I kind of, uh, it's so different than all of the work that I'm doing right now. It kind mm -hmm. of makes me feel like maybe I should return to that now several years later and explore this idea more. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not something that I've gotten to yet. Yeah, maybe something for the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to get through when you've, you know, thought enough of the, the curves and the circles to come through if you reach, you know, an end point there. Um, it's right. one of the, the key features of the exhibition and the work that we have of yours here currently, all the curves, all the circles, all those different pieces, um, just like offset to come through. And I think that's what really catches people's eye when they're walking through the galleries. They walk in and go, ooh, look at all the circles, you know, check out how did they do that and put that together. Um, and so in terms of starting with those first few pieces and starting with the inset scenes, then into offset and all of that precision, how did that then work into becoming a series? Um, and you know, how do they influence each other as you work through all these multiple pieces? Yeah, I think when I started working on offset, I had no idea that it would become a series at all. Um, and so the fact that it has become that has been really thrilling to kind of see. Um, so if I flip to this slide that has the first four of them, you know, when I made the first one, I was constrained by two colors. So when I came home, I thought, okay, well, I want to make the quilt bigger because offset's pretty small. It's, I think, 38 by 38. And so I thought I want the quilt to be bigger, but then I also want to introduce color. Um, when I started working in the series though, it helped me have constraints. So having the two color constraint with the first quilt really helped me focus instead of kind of getting lost in all of the things that I could include, um, constraints often help. And so with the second, third and fourth, 
you can see that I've stuck with a black background where I'm using black and white wedges, introducing little bits of color, um, but sticking with vertical uh, matchstick quilting on each of the quilts. And then kind of representing um, either a different number of concentric circles or um, how those wedges interact with each other kind of changes quilt to quilt. So when I started working in that series, I thought, well, what's one new thing that I could add to the next quilt? Uh, so with Offset Radial, the second in the series, which kind of helped name it the Radial <laughs> series, um, I introduced color um, into that quilt. And I actually thought that quilt was going to be a a full ring, um, but it got too noisy in, in terms of visual noise. There was no place for an eye to rest. Um, and so I had to start omitting some of the arcs so that uh, it was, you know, nice to look at. Right. Um, where with Red Hot Radial, I thought, okay, well, let's simplify some of the rings and then introduce these uh, rings of color so that uh, bright red, which happens to be Kona coral, um, mm. just really gives that pop of color that I was looking for. Um, and then with repelling radial, I thought, well, I'm going to go back to black and white and see if I can increase some of the complexity of the piecing and give an optical illusion. Um, so with all of these quilts, the arcs are all done with foundation paper piecing. Um, and then they're set, you know, sewn to each other and into the background with a regular curved seam. Um, and so my roots are very much planted in traditional quilt construction. Um, just think of instead of these pieces uh, being spikes, like what you would see in a Jacqueline Dijon quilt, um, these are pieced wedges uh, in a radial quilt. So that gives the idea of a wedges radiating from the center of the circle. Okay. And I'm here, you know, guessing that that radial title and kind of from that offset radial, like you just mentioned, those wedges radi radiating out is where those, those phrases and terms kind of came into play to go through for the construction of them. Yes. So when I was working on the second version, which is offset radial, and you can see that the idea kind of then carries through, if I give you a peek at 17 of the 20 quilts in the series now, um, they all kind of share that uh, uh, pieced wedges um, in concentric circles radiating from the center. Um, and with each one of these pieces, I did kind of think of it as trying something new. Now there is a illusion that these are all the same size quilts because they are, you know, in the same size photo. But these quilts range from uh, 30, uh, really 24 by 24 inches square up to 80 inches square. Uh, crescent radial on the bottom here, um, which is featured, right as you enter the exhibit in the museum is the largest of the radial quilts that I've made so far. Um, and so uh, definitely as I've thought about working in a series, it's been interesting to kind of think of that idea of including one new thing in each quilt, whether that's shifting the color of the background or introducing intersecting lines, which are piece that go through the whole quilt, um, and how to add my hand dyed fabrics into the series so that they are uh, complementary to the mm -hmm. overall design. So I've really loved working in this series, and it might surprise you to know that sometime last year, I thought maybe I was done with the series. Mm -hmm. um, I went five or six months without making a radial quilt. I was really focused on a different series that I think we'll talk about soon. Um, but I really thought, well, maybe, maybe I'm, you know, giving that idea a rest and exploring different things. Um, and then when I picked it back up, I had new ideas on how to represent that um, idea. 
lots of the concentric circles and radiating lines. So I don't think I'm quite done yet, but I definitely, at some point last year, I thought, well, you know, the idea well is a little dry on that end. So let's focus on something else. That's fantastic. I love seeing all of these together, even, you know, knowing that they're different sizes of the actual finished pieces, but just seeing them all together really highlights all those different constraints, all those different singular pieces, as you've been talking about, to kind of give new life to each, each different uh, radial set, as opposed to trying to cram it all um, together into a couple pieces, or like you said, kind of have to set it aside for a bit, maybe come back to it. There might be some more floating around um, to come, come in there. So in the sense of choosing all these different constraints, are you working on multiple pieces at the same time? Are you doing kind of one start to finish or kind of a single concept um, to go in there? And then in the sense too of if you have so many ideas or even when the ideas run low, how many you know are kind of waiting at a time when you're thinking about as you were at least starting out, you know, were you thinking it's going to be the next three quilts? Is it going to be just here's the next piece only that you're kind of figuring out what those constraints might be um, before stitching them up? Well, I definitely have plenty of ideas waiting in the wings. <laughs> um, but I feel like each idea sort of has its own time and place. Um, so I also, I work in phases. So it feels like for the last few months, I've been in kind of a heavy making phase where I've just been just doing a lot of sewing, a lot of quilting and a lot of finishing. And then sometimes I'll have a phase where I find myself teaching a lot. And so I'm doing a lot of preparation for virtual classes. And so I'm kind of like not doing a lot of sewing, but more prepping on that end. And then um, there are sometimes weeks where I just do a lot of computer work, where I'm sitting in front of Adobe Illustrator and thinking, gosh, am I ever going to come up with an idea for a quilt that I, <laughs> that I like again, or that I'm not like my heart is in it that I make. Um, so just in terms of ideas that are waiting, um, I think that this quilt on the bottom here, which is called Mobius Radial, I had that idea, idea for a long time to sort of start to manipulate the shape uh, and weight of the lines, but I didn't know how. And so my technical skill set in Illustrator wasn't there to uh, make the design that was in my mind, um, which is obviously based on the Mobius strip, which is the impossible shape uh, in mathematics. And so I had to bring up, I had to invest time to bring my Illustrator skill set up so that I could then create that. So sometimes ideas are waiting for the right skill to be there um, is kind of how I think about it. Um, in terms of whether I work on one thing at a time, I put these quilts side by side because I was working on Red Hot Radial in the summer of 2019. And this is number three in my radial quilt series. So I wasn't quite as efficient with my workflow. Um, and I wasn't as confident with my construction of the quilt. So it was taking me a long time. Mm. And so one Saturday afternoon, I had to take a break from Red Hot Radial. I thought I do not want to do paper piece, any more wedges today. And so I uh, did a little palette cleanser and I made the center two rectangles of angular number one. Mm -hmm. And then I set that aside for several months because I hadn't decided how to put a border on it. If I wanted to put a border on it, um, I didn't know how I wanted to quilt anything. <laughs> I was just <laughs> feeling very indecisive. And so for these two pieces, it was really important for me to take a break and work on angular number one for that day so that I could feel refreshed and return to Red Hot Radial. 
Um, and it's sort of serendipitous that I was working on these two quilts at the same time because both of these quilts ended up going to QuiltCon uh, in Austin, Texas, and both of them won ribbons in their categories. They were my very first ribbon that I ever earned. And so Fantastic. it was uh, really great to have the two that I worked on at the same time to help balance each other out um, mm -hmm. earn that award as well. That's very exciting and so very different, but sometimes you need that palette cleanser and kind of let those ideas marinate a little bit before you can decide what goes next for each piece, um, which can be can be difficult, I think, as quilters, as artists to step away from something and just wait until you know for sure, you know, where it's going to come or like you were saying with your design skills until those skills have kind of gotten to a point that will match what you're looking to do in the piece in the artwork itself. Um, and then we've had a question in terms of working on the uh, computer program to design and then are you printing those foundation pieces yourself? Um, and then someone had also asked what kind of paper are you using in terms of building the foundations and those templates for your wedges for your piecing? Yeah, so I've designed in both um, EQ8 and Adobe Illustrator. Um, I think that uh, when I started, EQ8 was a little bit easier for me to wrap my head around just in terms of designing because it's very quilt focused. Mm -hmm. And Adobe Illustrator is a vector based illustrator tool um, that's used by you know, designers and artists around the world. And so there's no shortage of information on the internet about Adobe Illustrator. Um, I was very lucky that I was developing a friendship um, with uh, my friend Ty Flanagan, and he was very generous in helping me learn Adobe Illustrator in the summer of 2020. And so I've definitely transitioned a lot of my design over to Illustrator at this point in time. Um, I do print paper templates and a lot of my patterns on my website have paper templates that accompany them. Um, and those all print on just regular old uh, at home printer paper, either US letter or A4 size, because, uh, you know, the rest of the world uses uh, paper size. It's not US letter. Um, and so I just, I tape together a lot of templates similar to, um, I think a lot of garment makers are really familiar with taping together paper templates to get their pattern pieces. My pattern templates are no different. And so I just print on regular old at home printer paper for whether it's a large size template. Um, one of the quilts that I have coming up in the presentation, I actually printed enough pages to make a 60 by 60 inch square. It was really difficult to move around my studio. I had to be very cautious. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, where there's a will, there's a way in terms of getting that uh, design ready. <laughs> Absolutely. I can only imagine trying to tape that together and keep it all square. And then I'm sure some of it too, cutting out certain of those template shapes to build the wedges. And then once, you know, those corners and extra pieces that so you need a lot of space or at least a, a good amount of wiggle room in, in the studio in order to prep all the pieces before you ever start sewing. Yeah, I have been known to uh, tape together several cutting mats and square things up uh, on the floor. So, you know, <laughs> again, this is where we think like uh, our tools are, um, we need our tools uh, so that we can, you know, achieve our vision. And so, you know, until they come up with a bigger mat size, I'll keep taping together my cutting mats and rulers so that I can make these big cuts. Absolutely. I love that. I know several people have mentioned wanting to know a little bit more about the quilting on these pieces, which we'll get to um, a little bit further in. So those of you who are wondering about the quilting and details, we'll, we'll get to those. Um, and I know you had briefly mentioned your colors, um, Red Hot Radial having the Kona um, coral in there, and then also having added into your series later on as you've added into your hand dyed fabrics. And I know that mm -hmm. a lot of the pieces we have in the exhibition use your hand dyed fabrics. So how did you get into that process? What do you enjoy about dyeing your own pieces to um, using them and kind of putting those together into your designs themselves? <laughs> 
Yeah. So um, I have a photo here of several hand dyed gradations um, that I created last year. Um, I would say my relationship with hand dyed fabrics goes back to my first discovery of hand dyed fabrics in quilts, which was um, I took a class, a workshop from Carol Breyer Fowler at Gentry in 2011. Um, she has since relocated from Paducah, but she had a wonderful studio classroom, everything right there on her property in Paducah. And uh, when you're in the class, um, you're surrounded by her quilts that feature wonderful hand-dyed fabrics. And uh, she is a master at uh, using, creating and using hand-dyed gradations. Um, she now has a fabric line from Benertex that features uh, commercially available fabrics with um, color gradations. And mm. she uses a lot of those in her quilts now too. But I remember being in her class and thinking that those colors just uh, went perfectly from one to the next, a true color gradation, which if you're trying to build a gradation from uh, commercially available solids, like a Kona solid or like a Moda Bella solid, there are certain mm -hmm. colors that just aren't going to be commercially produced. Mm -hmm. And so I came right home from that class after being inspired and I bought this book on hand dyed fabrics and it came and I thought, this looks really difficult. <laughs> and so I put the book down and it took me 10 years later um, in uh, 2020 when I was at QuiltCon in Austin, um, I took a class from Anna Joyce on ice dyeing, which is a very easy entry point into working with hand dyed fabrics. Um, there's a lot of unpredictability and spontaneity with the design and how it uh, reacts with the ice. And so um, it was a perfect entry point because I could then better understand how to safely work with the dyes. You know, what was soda ash and how does it help bond the dye to the fabric? Um, how to safely wash out and, and all of that kind of thing. And so um, after coming home, from the ice dyeing class, I thought, okay, I, I can pick this back up again. And um, then in 2020, when uh, many of us were spending a lot of time at home, I thought that was a good time to kind of invest in myself and um, do a pretty extensive self-study on hand dye fabrics. And so I read a lot on the internet and I ordered a bunch of dyes from Dharma Trading Company and ProChem um, in Massachusetts. And I spent pretty much every Saturday and Sunday morning that summer outside dyeing fabric and learning about dye. Um, and that really led me to being a student of Carol Soderlund's. Um, I think within the dyeing community, Carol Soderlund would be known as one of the experts in hand dyed fabrics, working with Procyon fiber reactive dyes, mm -hmm. um, safely targeting and achieving a color. And these gradations that you're seeing here on the photo are all, um, swatches that have come out of a book of over a thousand uh, colors that um, came from a class that was taught by Carol Soderlund. And so she really has enabled uh, a lot uh, and, and helped teach just a ton of information on hand dyed fabrics. And if anybody is interested in learning more about hand dyed fabrics, I would highly recommend taking a class from Carol Soderlund. Um, it's just, it, I can't speak highly enough of her. So um, with all of that kind of background, I started to uh, sneak hand dyed fabrics into some of my quilts. So I didn't start by making a quilt with all hand dyed fabrics. Instead, I took my very first gradation and I included it in a radial quilt um, that you see here, a linear radial. So the stripes on the bottom of the quilt go from kind of a light navy all the way to a magenta. And the colors 
flow seamlessly because of the dye method of dyeing a gradation where there's, you know, a little bit of each dye um, that goes that from one end to the other, you kind of slowly uh, add more of one color and that helps the finished dyes um, go from that light navy that you see to the magenta just effortlessly. So I started to take those um, fabrics and, you know, I have some that turned out pretty awful as well, but I started to take the ones that I like and incorporate them into my quilts. Um, this is another example where I sort of went all in. I um, dyed all of the fabrics in this quilt um, and this quilt earned a best use of color from one of the Mancuso shows earlier this spring, which I felt really excited about because I thought, well, I was in the driver's seat for all of that uh, color um, that you see in that quilt. And so I think um, I really enjoy mixing hand dyes with commercially available solids, but the texture that you get from a hand dyed fabric um, and the texture you're seeing here is um, kind of just a soft modeling or a soft marbling, mm -hmm. which to me, I see light coming into the quilt because you get just a little bit of shade variation in that modeling. Um, and I just think it's a really interesting visual texture and, and that's kind of where I'm <laughs> focused on. <laughs> Um, and all of these fabrics were dyed using a method called low water immersion dyeing. So anybody out there that's interested in getting started, um, that is definitely a technique that requires a uh, not a lot of um, not a lot of equipment um, in terms of dyeing. And then the photo on the upper right hand side of this slide um, is given just to show a detail of the quilting because mm -hmm. this quilt was quilted with a quarter inch grid. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is one of the quilts where I really started to invest a lot of time in doing dense quilting. It's fantastic. And a quarter inch, you said? <laughs> a quarter inch. <laughs> quarter inch. Whew, yeah, made, making sure I heard that right because that sounds incredibly tiny, but when you're standing in front of this piece in the exhibition as well, just seeing that it, it adds more of that texture and more detail to go with that grid quilting um, and, and all these fabulous colors in the hand dyes as well, which we just love. Um, and I know some of these, uh, I don't know if the next one is neon radial or not in your details, but I know that one's got some bright colors as well. And so it's kind of neat to see the different types of color combos that you're adding into your pieces. Um, is that tricky to choose which colors you want to kind of work in a specific piece? Or is, do some come easier than others? Well, this, I think with this quilt, Neon Radial, this is a good example of two things. So the first that I'll talk about is it's a great way to showcase those hand dyed fabrics. Um, so the magenta and the chartreuse colors that are included in this quilt are hand dyed. And you can see again, that light, uh, just that little marbling texture. I feel like that adds a lot to the quilt just in terms of depth um, and just making the color a little bit more interesting. Um, and with this quilt, um, you can see the inspiration on the right is one of my mini quilts. So I'm a big advocate of using a small quilt, like 24 by 24 inches or smaller to experiment with an idea because then it's less of a time commitment. It's less material investment. Um, so I, a lot of times will use a mini quilt to test an idea. And so with the quilt obtuse radial on the right, you can see that I had done diagonal quilting. So I did load this quilt diagonally on my long arm, which was a wild experience. Interesting. Um, but also I kind of digitally just on my iPhone mocked up those digital, those bright digital lines 
um, mm -hmm. thinking about how I could inset those uh, stripes. So the pink and chartreuse stripes are totally pieced within the quilt. They are not appliqued. And so I used that digital sketch as kind of a guide. Um, and then this is the quilt that I printed a full 60 by 60 paper version of. And then I drew, um, at this time I was designing an EQ and EQ won't let you uh, draw these lines on a quilt. Um, they won't let you draw across multiple blocks. And so when I printed the quilt full size, I just put pencil to paper, I taped a few rulers together and I was drawing these really long lines on top of the quilt to insert, um, insert those. And so I was making essentially one large paper template and then I cut that template apart and reassembled the quilt. So it felt very risky to me at the time because I hadn't ever done that before, but I also didn't know of another way to get that result of the quilt that I wanted. Um, and this quilt was honored with a first place ribbon in the modern quilts category this past year at the Paducah AQS show, which was very exciting for me. Um, and so I, I just, I, there's a lot that I really love about this quilt from the hand dyes to the diagonal quilting, um, to the colors using the hand dyes and how they contrast with, uh, the white and the black, which are commercially available solids. Um, it's definitely one of my favorite pieces. Very nice. It's fantastic. Just fantastic to see the process and a little bit of that design influence um, once you get ready to, to cut those pieces and put those all together as well. Mm -hmm. And there are two, so I think some of your newer ones in the radial series still that are mounted on canvas and kind of use all of these uh, hand dyes. They've got some grid quilting in them as well. And so they're kind of combining some of those same methods, but they are still a little bit different than some of the earlier pieces in the series to go together. And maybe where that influence kind of came from for those pieces or inspiration at least. Yeah. Um, so the two quilts you're speaking about, radial study number 19 and 20, are shown here. These two quilts um, are mounted on canvas, so they each measure 36 by 36, and they're mounted on a, a painter's canvas. Um, there are a couple things about this quilt are these two quilts that are interesting. Um, they do share a background fabric. And so I started these by dyeing the background and I did not know what I was gonna do with that background fabric, but I knew that it was for two radial quilts that would hang side by side at the museum. And so what I think is interesting about these is that the quilt on the right that has the purple wedges because it has purple wedges, the purple in the background kind of becomes more visible. And mm -hmm. then on the quilt on the uh, left with the yellow ring, it pulls the yellow values out of that background fabric. So I knew when I was dyeing this background that it was a, gonna be a really weird color because I was putting a light gray in, you know, and then kind of squirting different areas of the fabric with a pale yellow and a pale purple. And so I really, I had a lot of questions about how the background fabric was even going to turn out. Mm. And then I started to shop my stash of hand dyes to see, well, what are the hand dyed fabrics I already have that would complement these uh, background colors? And so really it was a journey of discovering what the right uh, things were going to be to pair with the background. Um, but when I decided I wanted to feature a couple canvas pieces at the museum, um, I was having a conversation with um, a quilter and a surface designer, Leslie Tucker Jennison, and she mentioned that when you put a quilt on a canvas, you automatically know what to do with it. It goes on the wall. Right. So we're all kind of programmed. This is a piece of art. This is going to go on the wall. It's mounted on a canvas. So the canvas just kind of helps provide clarity to that. And I thought that's such a great point because all of the quilts that are included in the exhibit are meant to be 
um, art quilts that are displayed on the wall. And so it just, there's no question about what these quilts are supposed to be because of the way that they're mounted. Um, and so I thought that just to kind of challenge the idea of what makes a quilt, is it still a quilt if it's on a canvas? I think so. It's three layers of textile stitched together with decorative stitching. Um, that's a quilt to me. And so the fact that it's on a canvas just makes it obvious what's supposed to be done with it. And I really, I love the way that these two pieces turned out, you know, cause it's not a, they don't feel, uh, they're, the coloration's a little weird mm -hmm. in them because of that background fabric, but I are unique, maybe I should say. Um, but I think that I'm really pleased with the way they turned out. They look fantastic and especially on the walls in the gallery too you know they kind of pop out that canvas brings them out a little bit from the wall instead of being completely you know flat and and so they grab the attention of viewers coming through to go with it um and there's a lot of straight lines in your quilting i know we've yeah. mentioned that one of the grid that quarter inch grid i know these pieces have a little bit of a grid to them as well um are there specific thread colors, threads, or you know, details in terms of keeping those all straight lines from piece to piece, or which ones are determined in terms of these are all straight, following elements in the piece, or which ones get the grid versus just parallel lines to come across in your pieces as well? Well, with this, these two quilts, I definitely knew that I would start with straight lines, but it wasn't until I got the first round of straight lines done that I decided to turn the quilt 90 degrees and do a little bit more quilting on half the quilt. Mm -hmm. um, but the next quilts that I sh will share really kind of emphasize how powerful thread can be. Um, it's very powerful. And in one of my new series, the uh, Aura quilts, um, these quilts mm -hmm that I'll show you only have two seams in them, um, which is to set the ring into the background. And these are all hand dyed fabrics. You can see that um, really nice texture that comes from that hand dyed fabric. Um, but the, the difference that you're seeing in the quadrants of the quilt is done exclusively because of the thread, the quilting thread. And so with this one and the next one that I'll show you, you can see, how bold uh, dense quilting can really show up against a background fabric. And really the inspiration for using thread in this way came from a class that I took with my friend Carson Converse. I took a class with her at a quilt con that was called, um, uh, it was on using thread as a layer of design because I had in the past um, fallen into the trap of um, just not wanting to mess it up when I got to the quilting step. And I wasn't thinking holistically about how I could use thread to complement the design elements that I had achieved with piecing. Um, and so with really um, some of the radio quilts and then especially these this series that I'm working in, I'm really using thread as a layer of design and shifting the color of the background of the fabric um, because of the the bold thread colors. Um, and I just, I don't know that I would have had that bravery had I not uh, taken that class. And, you know, now Carson's a close friend and it's really um, nice to see how we're all kind of working with thread a little bit differently. Um, because I know some of her pieces are heavily focused on creating designs with uh, thread um, and they're beautiful. So to clarify, because I know this is something our staff and volunteers have mentioned when the exhibit first went up and our visitors too, it's kind of that wow effect when you stand in front of these pieces, not just because these are larger pieces, um, somewhere in that 83 or so inch square, but it's the same background fabric and those different quadrants are because you're using two different colors of thread and the way those crisscross um, really highlight those changes. And I think that needs to be restated because it's kind of mind blowing how much just that thread can it alter the whole perception of the piece and those color tones. 
Right. And um, I mean, the entire quilt is covered in thread, right? So you don't even get a true idea of what color the the background fabric truly was before adding all of that thread. So um, what I did was I used the extra hand dyed fabric for the sleeve and the quilt label. So you can see on the back of the quilt, what did that background fabric look like before mm -hmm. I added all of that thread? So you can kind of, if, you know, someone's walking around with a glove on, they can pull up the corner of the quilt and they can see what did that, what was the background color on the label of the quilt before adding all of that thread? Um, and yeah, like I said, I just, I want to fully attribute, um, this mm -hmm. idea to that class and with Carson, because she really kind of helped me break down some of the roadblocks or the barriers that I had in my mind about what thread, how thread can add to a design versus just doing the steps to complete, um, at, you know, uh, securing the three layers of the quilt together, um. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about how I could add a layer of design until that class. And so I think, you know, I want to fully um, attribute that to her. Fantastic. And are they solid colored threads or a variegated? They're totally people? solid threads. Yeah. This thread specifically is um, Glide. It's by a company called Habendash and it's a polyester thread. Okay. Wonderful. It's just, there's so many ways to bring color to quilts and to combine and really work all of those details together, which is one of the things I love in your modern loops and your watercolor series, the way that they overlapped or intersect those different colors and pieces together, allow you to bring in some of that light, some of that transparency um, to come through. And they're kind of completely different in a way even though there's still curves from the radial designs that we've already been discussing. Yeah. And I actually forgot, I have one more slide on the thread topic. Um, sorry about that, Becky, but um, I did want to say I have two versions of a similar quilt design here, Mobius radial number one, which was the um, time that I, uh, experimented with this idea and then Mobius radial two, which is a kind of a reverse. If you look, it's a reverse image <clears throat> and it's uh, what ended up becoming a quilt pattern available on my website. And you can see the one on the left, I quilted with horizontal lines and that results in a shorter, wider quilt. And the quilt on the right, I quilted with vertical lines, which um, are make it a more narrow but taller quilt. So in terms of the power of thread, it's not just going to alter the background color of your quilt and any fabrics within. It's also going to um, impact the, the way your quilt shrinks and the final um, how, you know, it could turn a circle into an oval, essentially, which is what I found. So I meant to mention that earlier. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great to know that it does give you some variance and you have to maybe experiment a little bit with that um, yeah. to go through. Yeah. But could you ask your question again on the modern loops and watercolor quilts? Yeah, it's the way that there's still those curves and, and details, but the way that they cross, especially in this piece, modern loops, the way they those circles intersect and changing the colors or changing which layer has the transparency um, in the watercolor quilts as well, how those colors kind of blend in together. It's a different variation or a different focus um, than the, the radial designs specifically, but they're still really neat of uh, how those colors and pieces interact together. Yeah, so for the modern loops quilt, um, with this version, I was kind of looking at um, what would it look like if some of the loops had transparency effect, if some of the loops kind of had a true overlap, underlap. And um, really, this was the first quilt that I made this year. So I really just wanted to get into the studio and work with some of those hand dyed fabrics that I had spent um, the winter dyeing. Um, mm -hmm. So I wasn't as concerned about a true transparency effect with this quilt, but in the next slide on my watercolor quilts, I definitely am very focused um, on the value um, and the hue of each fabric when I'm working on a watercolor quilt. Um, both of uh, number one and number two were done with 
commercially available fabrics. Um, so I had not started dyeing fabrics at this time. Um, but the fourth version of this quilt was done exclusively with hand dyes, except for the background. The background is commercially available black. And the intent for this quilt was to start with a very bright saturated color in the center and then kind of fade to black. Um, this quilt is included in the exhibit. It's kind of sister or cousin, which isn't pictured, started dark in the center and faded to white on the outside. And that one's available to see on my website. Um, and so I really enjoy working with um, hand dyed uh, fabrics and gradations. Okay, wonderful. And we, I know we've talked a lot about your fabric pieces and parts. So aside from fabrics, aside from your sewing machine, of course, what yeah. tools are kind of the most important for you in creating these stunning pieces? I think for me, I've included this photo on the left that include my favorite pressing tools. I think pressing is one of the things that kind of we don't talk about or emphasize enough when we're talking about our work because I probably spend more time pressing my seams than sewing my seams. And so here I've uh, shown my wool pressing mat, my iron, and then I actually started making long skinny clappers um, that help. It's a tailor's clapper uh, tool that's been used for a long, long time for garment construction. And I make them, they're long and skinny for quilt seams. And so these are definitely my favorite tools aside from my sewing machine. Um, on the right, I've just shown a picture where I'm blocking a quilt. That's definitely another step that um, if you haven't ever blocked a quilt, it helps keep things nice and square. And that might be, you know, something to Google after the presentation today, how to block a quilt. Absolutely. I know the there's got to be a lot of seams, a lot of different details in your work. Um, some of those clappers we have available in our gift shop currently for sale. And I know that you sell them through your web shop. Um, so if you can let us know where to find you online to be inspired by your work, but also where to look for your patterns and your tools as well, that'd be great. Yeah, um, I can be found on Instagram at cotton and bourbon. Uh, I named myself that because I'm a quilter from Kentucky where all of the bourbon is made. And my website is cottonandbourbon.com. And um, I teach virtual classes as well as sell quilt patterns and uh, clappers and rulers and all kinds of good stuff. So if you've been inspired by the chat today and you want to learn a little bit more, uh, head to my website and check it out. Wonderful. Well, it's been a pleasure to chat with you, Audrey. It's a joy to have your quilts here at the museum. We hope people are able to visit in person or at least check you out, check the museum out, quiltmuseum.org and social media to see some of those pieces here as well. Thank you so much. And thanks to Sakwa for inviting me for the textile talk. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Becky and Audrey. It has been so much fun to see how you've uh, really pushed this series or these three series in all of these different directions. And I really enjoyed that. Um, I wanna say thank you also to our sponsors and donors who keep Textile Talks viewing uh, going and thank you to all of you, our viewers who keep coming back each week. I know there are some of you who have been to just as many Textile Talks as I have, and uh, I see you and we appreciate you. I hope you all have a wonderful Wednesday and we will see you next week at the same time for A Change of Heart, San Diego artists Charlotte Bird and Marty O, presented by Visions Museum of Textile Art. And as always, you can register and find all of the info at sakwa.com slash textile talks. Thanks everyone. Have a great Wednesday.